Great. Well, it looks like we've hit 12.01. Um, I think I will start off um, the webinar here and let people kind of log in as we, as we continue to go. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Maya Swope, and I am the Outreach and Volunteer Coordinator here at Friends of the Boundary Waters Wilderness. We're really excited to have you all join us for this afternoon's Lunch with the Friends presentation. We've got a really great speaker who knows a lot about invasive species and can help you know, answer some questions that anyone might have, as well as provide some more background on this issue and how it affects the Boundary Waters. Um, a few sort of notes before we get started. We will have time for questions at the end of the session. So if you have any questions throughout, you can put them in the Q&A feature that's at the bottom of your screen. Um, feel free to add those anytime and we'll get to as many as we can at the end. Um, if you have comments or any other like technical issues, you can put those in the chat and I will try to respond to those throughout the presentation as well. Um, well, I'll give you a little bit of background about Friends of the Boundary Waters. We are a nonprofit organization um, really dedicated to protecting the boundary waters and the communities that interact with the boundary waters. So we really see our mission as having three parts as community, people, and wilderness. Um, for the wilderness, you know, that's kind of our job is protecting the wilderness itself, whether that is from aquatic invasive species or sulfide mining or other threats. We're working in a variety of ways to protect and preserve the wilderness. We also recognize that people play a really important role in the boundary waters and are part of the reason that it's such a special place. And so recognizing that access to the boundary waters, education about the boundary waters um, is crucial to our work as well. And then finally, we have community, and that's sort of the recognition that the communities at the edge of the boundary waters are really intertwined with the health of the ecosystem, with the fate of the wilderness area, and we work to make sure that communities at the gateway to the boundary waters are strong and healthy and resilient as well. Um, so if you want to know more about Friends of the Boundary Waters, I recommend checking out our website that I will put in the, in the chat in a minute as well. Um, but for now, I'm going to turn it over to Meg Durer, who is the Research and Outreach Specialist um, at the Minnesota Aquatic Invasive Species Research Center um, through the University of Minnesota. And I will let her give a little bit more of a bio about herself and um, take it away with the presentation. So thanks so much, Meg, for being here. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Maya. And thank you to the Friends of the Boundary Waters for this opportunity to speak with you all. Um, I am the research outreach specialist at MACERC, the Minnesota Aquatic Invasive Species Research Center. And um, my main job is to serve as the bridge between our researchers at the university and people who rely on our research innovations to make decisions to manage invasive species risks, uh, to manage them, to try to control and prevent them. And so this is a, a great opportunity to talk to people really interested in the boundary waters because as Maya said this group is all about people and um, aquatic invasive species is a biology but it's also a people issue and um, I think with that I'll just jump right into it you'll hear more about MACERC and the issue of AIS and as it pertains to the boundary waters as we move into it so So I wanted to start with a basic understanding um, of AIS to make sure we're all on the same page about that and why we should be concerned. Um, an aquatic species is any type of organism, either plant, animal, or pathogen, that depends on water for at least one stage of its life. And an invasive species is a species that has spread or been introduced beyond its native range and is either causing harm or has the potential to cause harm. And invasive species cause tremendous harm to our environment, our economy, and human health. They've been responsible for huge declines in biodiversity around the world, and in some cases directly implicated in extinctions. And with the escalation of global trade and travel, invasive species are spreading faster than ever. And um, we spread them in unintentionally through aquarium pet releases into a lake, and a lot of times in Minnesota through recreational activities like fishing, hunting, or boating. Um, $123 billion per year is the highly conservative estimate of the annual cost of damages that AIS pose to 
infrastructure like hydropower plants, water supplies, and aquaculture. And of course, there are a lot of less tangible impacts to AIS to the quality of life on our Minnesota lakes and how we recreate on them. And here in the land of 14,380 lakes, um, our water resources are of utmost importance and highly valued for this. Um, and just about in Minnesota, just about anybody who can afford it has at least one boat to access these waters. And we have between 850 and 900,000 registered watercraft in the state and over 2,200 public launches that are accessible to trailers. And then of course, there's Lake Superior to contend with. Um, and the twin port towns of Duluth and Superior are considered the largest freshwater port in the world. They're also the furthest inland port in the world. And this has had major implications for the spread of aquatic species that are native to Europe, Asia, and the Mediterranean. And the Great Lakes shipping industry is indeed how the majority of our aquatic invasive species, including zebra mussels, invasive phragmites, and spiny water fleas, arrive to Minnesota. And then we're also at risk from our large river systems. Um, from the south, we have Asian carp species making their way up the Mississippi River and other AIS that are expanding their northward range, particularly as our state becomes warmer and warmer due to the climate crisis. So the challenges are massive. Many of our AIS have been present and problematic since the 80s or even earlier in the case of common carp or curly leaf pondweed. But it wasn't really until the early to mid 2000s that public awareness of their impacts in Minnesota reached any kind of critical mass. And by about 2010, AIS were costing the state millions of dollars to year, of, millions of dollars every year to manage, often with little success. And then the issue kind of became on our radar fully. Fortunately, we're passionate about protecting our lakes in Minnesota. And there was widespread agreement that we needed innovation and better tools to deal with these problems. So back in 2012, leaders from the U of M, the legislature, the DNR, and nonprofits came together to create a first of its kind research center focused solely on AIS. And that year, the legislature appropriated funds to create what is now the Minnesota Aquatic Invasive Species Research Center, or MACERC. <clears throat> MACERC was formed to strengthen our state's capacity for solving AIS problems and to do so in a collaborative, coordinated, and stable manner, stable environment that allows for long-term research needs to be addressed. We do this by bringing together researchers from all the disciplines necessary to tackle AIS problems. So in addition to supporting invasion biologists, we work with policy, human behavior, engineering, economics, and social science experts. And being housed at the U of M allows us to bring together and support the kinds of interdisciplinary teams necessary to get this work done. We currently support 29 research fellows that are typically PhD level scientists working at universities or agencies and 19 master's level or PhD students. And we also have multiple advisory teams of professional water managers and community leaders outside of academia to help guide our research priorities and implementation. <clears throat> we are the only um, entirely AIS focused research center of its kind in the US right now. And we house arguably the most concentrated brain power on AIS solutions in the country, maybe even the world. And although I'm gonna start focusing on AIS issues and species affecting Northern Minnesota and the Boundary Waters, I want to make it clear that we work across the entire state and across these six broad research categories that are indicated by the map legend here. Um, so when we think about AIS risk and means of spread, we most often worry about motor boaters, and that is for good reason. Um, there's no debate that recreational motorboats have been the source of the vast majority of spread of AIS throughout our inland Minnesota lakes. And they come in a bewildering array of makes and models with tons of places for AIS to hide. And they can be difficult to clean boaters trailer from one lake to another in a short period of time. We know that paddling on the other hand represents a cleaner, simpler and slower way to experience our lakes. Um, and canoes do pose a significantly lower risk than motorized watercraft. And that's probably one of the main reasons why the Boundary Waters maintains its fantastic lakes and high quality fishing. 
But the boundary waters are not AIS free, unfortunately. And some of the species that are of the highest concern and impact can be easily spread by paddlers if you're not careful. And on the topic of uncareful visitors to the boundary waters, I'm sure we all caught the news about surging use of Minnesota's lakes, parks, and open spaces, especially the boundary waters over the last two summers. Um, and I don't intend to downplay the damage uh, to the ecosystem and the visitor experience that litter, oversized groups, and cutting live trees has, but we can recover from these impacts. Um, trash can be picked up, trees will grow back, a rowdy group of campers causes only a temporary disturbance. But just imagine all the new invasive species that uninformed and careless visitors could import or spread around. We won't know the extent of these damages for some time, and even more worrisome, the AIS will likely be there to stay. Um, and the species that I'm going to be talking about today really don't have any control or eradication methods. Um, so really prevention is our only approach. And then for the species that we do have um, control methods for, just imagine how difficult from an operational and permitting perspective it would be to treat an aquatic infestation in a highly remote federally designated wilderness. So I'll emphasize this again and again in this talk, prevention is often our best and only tool for dealing with AIS in the boundary waters. And just as a side note here um, on the issue of awareness, in all of these news articles, invasive species was mentioned only one time. I also wanna point out that there's been a renewed interest in the leave no trace principles after what happened last season. And that is wonderful and important, but Leave No Trace has, in my opinion, um, a significant blind spot when it comes to invasive species. And that's why I wanna encourage any visitors, guides, or outfitters on this call to also check out the Play Clean Go campaign, as well as May Cirque's Stop Spiny campaign that you're gonna hear more about in a minute. Um, the Play Clean Go mindset is really important for travelers, travelers to the boundary waters because we have two types of risk to minimize here. We need to avoid unintentionally introducing a new invasive species to the boundary waters. And we need to avoid moving existing invasives around within the wilderness, increasing the extent of infestations and putting more lakes at risk. So there are a handful of AIS species, unfortunately, already present in the boundary waters. But I'm going to focus on two issues primarily, spiny water fleas and bait fish diseases. But I did also want to briefly mention rusty crayfish because these are a big concern for Canadian parks and US Forest Service managers. Um, they've been around since the 80s or 90s and believed to be introduced by anglers as live bait. These guys are significantly larger and more aggressive than our native crayfish species and their omnivorous feeding habits impact plant, fish, and invertebrate communities. <clears throat> um, preventing their spread is fortunately pretty easy. Don't touch them, don't move them, and don't bring any more of them into the boundary waters. So let's talk about spiny water fleas. This image here is a single spiny water flea on someone's fingertip, so you can get the idea of how small these things are. They're about the size of a grain of rice and semi-transparent, barely visible to the naked eye, and so they can be easily moved around on contaminated fishing gear or in residual water. So that's the leftover puddles of water in the bottom of your canoe or bait bucket, or maybe you have the misfortune of stepping in over your boots and you fill your boots with water. Um, about spines, I wanna first note that they are not actually a flea or any type of insect. There's type of crustacean zooplankton and they spend most of their life in the water column. Um, while they're small to us, compared to native zooplankton species, they are massive. They're also voracious predators who consume vast amounts of native zooplankton. This is a big concern in our lakes because native zooplankton are a really important part of the diet of many fish species when they're in their early life stage. Another important factor in their invasiveness is the barbed tail spine that you can see. Because of this spine, they're basically inedible to the fish species that consume zooplankton as prey. And that same spine is what tends to get them tangled up on recreational fishing gear and fosters their unintentional spread. More on that in a few more slides. But so they don't have any pressure from predators because they're not native to the area. And they have a major, major competitive advantage in their own feeding. And spiny water fleas can quickly take over the zooplankton biomass of a lake. 
And this is helped along by the fact that newly hatched spiny water fleas reach sexual maturity as early as one week old and have a highly flexible reproductive strategy that can foster exponential growth. And probably the most scary thing about spiny water fleas is that right now we have no tools available to control or eradicate them once they're in a lake. Not like Minnetonka, not a Boundary Waters Lake. So prevention truly is our only tool. This is a quick overview of where they're currently found in North America. Like most of our AIS we deal with in Minnesota, they arrive to our state via the Great Lakes shipping industry. They're native to Eastern Europe and Scandinavia. They most likely got here in the ballast water of an overseas freight vessel. Our first inland lake detection of spinies was 1990 at Island Lake Reservoir north of Duluth. And at this point in time, they've been confirmed in 66 water bodies throughout the state. This is a screenshot from an interactive map we host at our website, stopspiny.org. And as you can see, most of our lakes are in the far north with the exceptions of Duluth area and, and the Lax. So this um, does lead people to believe that spiny water fleas might only be a concern for cold, clear lakes, but that's not true. Um, even popular metro lakes like Lake Minnetonka are at risk. We know this because we have lakes even further south than Lake Minnetonka in Wisconsin with similar temperature profiles that have severe spiny water flea infestations. So this is a screenshot from this um, wonderful route planning tool that the Friends has um, created and hosted on the website. And here's a look at which lakes in the Arrowhead are currently known to be infested with spiny water fleas. I would, like to, I would have liked to overlap to those two maps, but I didn't quite um, have enough time. Um, but the take home point is that there are numerous lakes inside of Boundary Waters with known spiny water flea populations. And several popular entry point lakes have them, including Lake Vermilion and Fall Lake. <clears throat> so why should we care about spiny water fleas in our lakes? Um, Last year, a MACERC research team wrapped up a major study of how the species and zebra mussels impact walleye and perch populations in Minnesota's nine large walleye lakes. So that includes Rainy Lake, Vermilion, Mille Lacs, and Leech. They collected samples from all levels of the lake's food webs and paired this with a statistical analysis of 35 years of data from the DNR's annual survey of juvenile walleye and yellow perch to look at the differences in the size and growth of these species across lakes with zebra mussels or spiny water fleas or both. And they also looked at the size and growth at uninvaded lakes. What they found should be pretty alarming to anybody who cares about walleye fishing in Minnesota. The researchers found that walleye in their first year of life grew more slowly in the presence of spiny water fleas and were 12 to 14% smaller at the end of their first summer. And this happens because both spiny water fleas and baby walleye eat zooplankton to survive. Because spiny water fleas can become so much more abundant than young walleye, and they're so successful at capturing prey, they reduce the food for walleye. The fish then have to switch to lower quality food, or they expend more energy finding food, and this results in slower growth. Slower growth in the first year is a major concern for walleye populations because it means they have fewer choices of things to eat because the smaller your mouth is, the fewer prey items you can choose from. They're more vulnerable to predators. The smaller you are, the more things that can eat you. And they have lower energy reserves to survive the first winter. All of these factors add up to decreased rates of survival in the long term. And a special concern to us um, in the Boundary Waters is what might happen in lakes with both zebra mussels and spiny water fleas. The study found that walleye are 25% smaller in their first year than in lakes without either species. So lakes that are already under stress from climate change or other AIS, those, those impacts can compound with the addition of spiny water fleas. The other study that's really relevant um, that Maser carried out looked at specifically how spiny water fleas are spreading. So we know, like I said, that recreational boaters and anglers are the source of a lot of AIS spread among inland lakes, but this team wanted to find out if there were specific types of fishing equipment that collected more spiny water fleas than others, and if certain methods pose an elevated risk. The goal, of course, was to help improve our prevention efforts. 
And to figure this out, the team went to two lakes with established finite populations, and they deployed a variety of commonly used fishing equipment, surface trolled lines, anchors, trolled downriggers, as well as live wells and bait buckets. And while deploying the fishing gear, another research boat worked alongside them towing plankton nets so they could document the density of spiny water fleas in the water column and then measure that against what was collecting on the, fine, on the fishing gear. The team found that trolled lines from the surface or on a downrigger collected the most spiny water fleas. They also saw that while re reeling in a fishing line, the spinies tended to clump up on pole islets or fishing tackle. So in short, lines snag spines. And if you remember from our close-up of a spiny water flea, it's that barbed tail spine that snares them on fishing gear, particularly lines that are trolled horizontally through the water. And what happens is you get one or two caught and more and more get caught on each other, resulting in these gelatinous looking clumps. They also found that spiny water fleas can survive in small amounts of leftover water in bait buckets and bilge areas. So out of the water, spiny water fleas can dry out quickly and die. But if they're in a cool, moist environment, or if it's a short trip between lakes, spiny water fleas will spread. So this study focused on motorboat angling practices, and they found that downriggers were most, one of the most risky types of gear. Um, but canoe-based angling is far from risk-free. Um, the key findings were that lines trolled horizontally through the water, particularly through deeper water, collected the most spiny water fleas. So any trolled line could accumulate spiny water fleas. And if you're using tackle like this dipsy diver thing, which I've heard are popular with Boundary Waters anglers, that sends your lure deeper into the water. You want to pay extra attention for spinies as you're reeling in. Residual water in canoes is another potential vector for spreading spinies between lakes. We all know how there always seems to be that puddle of water in the canoe. And while most of it drifts out on your head and back during a portage, there can be a surprisingly high volume of water that flows along the side of the boat and collects under the deck. Researchers have established that spiny water fleas and other species like zebra mussel larvae can survive for extended periods in tiny amounts of residual water. So the shorter your portage is, the higher risk there is of spinies surviving that trip. Though they can be easily spread, fortunately it's easy to prevent it. When you're portaging or packing up your fishing gear, Take a few extra moments to wipe up that puddle of water. The same goes for bait buckets. We need anglers to wipe out all corners and other nooks of crannies where water and AIS could hide out in. We have to wipe down fishing gear to get the spiny water fleas off the line, pole and tackle before moving to another lake. And last but not least, try to get that sponge or cloth as dry as possible before using it at the next portage. <clears throat> Another great option when it comes to trip planning is to consult our map of spiny infested lakes. And note if you will be traveling through any infested lakes. It might be a good idea to just consider skipping the fishing at these particular spots and also budget the time to take a few extra moments to inspect your gear for spiny water fleas before portaging off those lakes. Um, and I want to recommend a new addition to your gear list. <clears throat> A closed cell sponge or cloth with non-looped fibers for cleaning off gear and soaking up residual water is a great tool. Um, and I would say quick drying is also essential because spiny water fleas could survive if they were wadded up in a damp cloth over a short portage. Um, if you have been to a public boat launch somewhere this summer in the Arrowhead region, you may have received one of our printed Swedish dishcloths from the boat inspector there. Um, we have partnered with local managers and community leaders throughout northern Minnesota on this campaign to stop the spread. And a key component was to develop these Swedish dishcloths with prevention messaging printed on them and distribute them to boaters in high risk areas. Um, our researchers actually experimented with a variety of fabrics and found that this material is the best for cleaning spiny water fleas off gear and absorbing residual water. They dry super fast, they don't have looped fibers, and they pose the lowest risk for harboring spinies. And they work like a sponge and a cloth. So anyway, um, I highly recommend adding a Swedish disc cloth to your gear list. Pretty affordable and they will take up almost zero space or weight. And they are the best tool for cleaning your gear from spiny water fleas. 
So we've talked about fishing gear and bait buckets and how that can spread spiny water fleas. But what about the bait itself? Um, Maserk researchers have been studying um, multiple dimensions of this issue for quite a few years now, um, investigating the diseases and pathogens most commonly found in Minnesota's live bait fish supply. Uh, we've surveyed anglers to better understand their preference and patterns, and we've modeled the risk of disease spread through the bait fish pathway. Um, and the risk is substantial, um, and, but the goal of all this is to better understand the scope and scale of the issue in order to someday soon provide research-based recommendations for regulatory agencies, bait fish suppliers, and anglers. Because um, one thing we've learned um, through the survey work is that even with the cost factor right now, the inconvenience of dealing with live bait, um, live bait is probably here to stay because um, the method remains extremely popular, even among Boundary Waters anglers. One of the first parts of the study looked at the prevalence of disease in the bait fish supply, um, and they focused on the most popular and widely available species, the golden shiner. Um, the group partnered with undercover officers from the DNR um, to purchase golden shiners from over 25 different bait shops around the state and then using veterinary diagnostic tools and fisheries methods, looked at the range of pathogens found in the sampled fish. Um, and they found a fairly high prevalence of fish diseases that can directly threaten our native fish populations. So as you can see from this table, um, three species of bacteria, one parasite, and as well as a virus. These were relatively common in the sample of golden shiners surveyed. Um, and then, so even, even before research that from MACERG that provided clarity on the types of pathogens and their prevalence, um, live bait had already been recognized as a potential pathway for spread of fish disease. And fortunately, our invasive species laws reflect this. Um, it is already illegal to release unused or unwanted bait in waterways. However, um, it was there was a large, a widespread concern among managers and biologists that compliance was quite low, and we wanted to figure out why. Was it a lack of knowledge about the law? Um, is it because people didn't have facilities to dispose of bait? Um, did they feel uncomfortable? Um, throwing away live bait as the law requires. So we have been involved in a survey effort of anglers. Um, 8,000 anglers have been contacted um, through this project, uh, both mail letters and emails to really dig into their motivations and attitudes about live bait in Minnesota. Um, they've the team has received over 1,400 responses so far, um, a good amount to do a pretty robust um, statistical analysis. And the early analysis suggests that although most anglers intend to follow the regulations regarding bait, 30% of respondents indicated that they were just as likely as not to release the leftover bait um, back into the water in the future. Um, and more concerningly too, this behavior is fairly widespread across geographic locations and different demographics of angler. So there's not like one distinct group that we can target, but there is a distinct class of angler that visits um, over 100 trips per year fishing at lakes. And they also report that they release live bait. So there's one group that has a seriously disproportionate impact. Um, and that's pretty similar to other AIS issues and environmental problems. Most people know and want to do the right thing but you have that small proportion of users that can unravel a large scale communal effort like AIS prevention. Um, a lot of people call the Boundary Waters the last best place. And for many people, that's because of the quality of the fishing. Um, in these relatively undisturbed watersheds, um, it remains unparalleled compared to the fishing in the rest of Minnesota. And cautious use of live bait and proper disposal practices are essential if we want to maintain this. So let's talk about what um, a boundary water angler can do. 
So um, live bait is still allowed in the US portion of the Boundary Waters, but it has been banned in the Quetico Park. Um, I've not heard of catastrophic declines in fishing success in the Quetico, so it might be good to consider making the switch to artificial lures while you're fishing in the Boundary Waters. If you do use live bait, um, you need to bury any used bait fish inland as you would other fish carcasses, at least 200 feet inland away from portages or campsites and covered with leaf litter or rocks. Used bait water can also harbor AIS and pathogens, so it should be poured out on dry ground at least 200 feet from a lake or stream. And lastly, talk to your friends and family who fish about this issue and model ethical and legal bait disposal practices and help your fellow Boundary Waters anglers do the same. While we're on the topic of live bait, I wanna bring up another type of bait that threatens our forests, and that would be non-native earthworms. So we might like to see European earthworms in our gardens, um, but they're really bad for our forests because they alter the soil structure and nutrient availability on the forest floor in ways that hurt understory plants and they limit tree regeneration and increase erosion. Um, European earthworms are already established in the boundary waters and having impacts, but an emerging threat is the jumping worm, which is a different worm species. Uh, it's from Asia and it's having much more serious impacts. So whereas European earthworms make it harder for native plants to reproduce and grow, jumping worms change the soil structure so quickly and strip so many nutrients from the soil that plants actually die. Um, they also reproduce much more rapidly than European earthworms. Um, unfortunately, jumping worms do not make popular bait because they tend to thrash around and easily come off hooks. However, um, worm bait purchased in retail settings that's labeled as a red wiggler or a night crawler, it's possible that it could be contaminated with jumping worms. Um, and as Worms and Minnesota, there's going to come to risk of contamination. And unfortunately, right now, the Minnesota DNR classifies jumping worms as an unlisted non native species, meaning that they're still legal to possess, import, buy, or sell. So we're really relying on anglers here to make informed choices and carefully inspect their worm bait for jumping worms. Um, just some other simple steps you can take to cut down the risk is use artificial worms. Um, and if you do use live worms, never ever dump unused worms onto the ground or in the water. They have to be bagged and removed with all of your other trash. Oh, sorry, I'm going backwards. Okay, so about to wrap things up here uh, and move on to the Q&A. If you wanna learn more about the issues I've spoken about today or any of the research subjects mentioned, um, I'd encourage you to visit our website, maysert.umn.edu. Um, we also have a site specifically developed for our Stop Spiny campaign. If you wanna take a deeper dive into this issue or would like to support the campaign in your own community, um, we have links um, that have shareable social media content like YouTube videos and posters. There's instructions on how to clean gear. There's fact sheets. And we have a whole range of information about spiny water fleas. At MACERC, we've been working um, for almost the entire last year to get county managers, community leaders, folks from lake associations on board with the Stop Spiny campaign. And we have provided this toolkit, as well as training modules to help people get the word out about this species, because very few people understand that they're even a thing or the risk of how they spread. So visit stopspiny.org or um, send me an email if you want to get involved. Um, and then we have a YouTube channel with a ton of recorded presentations from MACERC researchers. So just go to YouTube and search for MACERC. And then the last thing I wanted to mention was our AIS detectors program. And that trains volunteers to get meaningfully involved in the fight against AIS in their community. Um, with many AIS, early detection is often the best and only chance we have to contain and control them. And we've got over 14,000 lakes. There's nowhere near enough biologists out there to find those new invasions. So 
To address this gap, we developed the AIS Detectors Program that trains volunteer participants in AIS identification, how to distinguish from an AIS between a native lookalike, um, and it teaches you how to report the findings and support response efforts. Um, to date, we have a network of over 300 detectors throughout Minnesota, and we're always looking for more to join the ranks. And consider learning how to surveil for AIS. It could be a great activity on your next trip to the Boundary Waters. So that is all I have. Um, thank you for tuning in and for your interest in helping slow the spread of AIS in the Boundary Waters. Um, looks like we have time for questions. I'm happy to stick around until one. Great. Well, thank you so much, Meg. That was great. Uh, very yeah, helpful information that I think all of us need to be talking about um, when we're talking about some of those like leave no trace principles and things. Um, I saw a few folks asking if this was recorded. Um, yeah, we are recording this. Um, it'll be up on our Friends of the Boundary Waters YouTube page later this week, and I will send a link to that to everyone that registered for this session. Um, so kind of jumping into the Q&A, um, let me search a little bit through here. Somebody is wondering, um, Adam asks, is there any evidence a spiny flea population will quickly peak and crash naturally? Um, I I don't know. They're, they're difficult to study the population dynamics, and it seems to be really variable um, across lakes and in different years. I've, I've heard reports that um, some years at Island Lake Reservoir, where they were first found in Duluth, some years people don't see them at all, and other years they explode. So those, those relationships are still being explored. Um, there's probably not any it's hard for me to think of a situation where their population would like crash to a level where they weren't having an impact because they lay these things called resting eggs and they, um, they, can, they can reproduce sexually or asexually and the resting eggs are the asexual form and they can stay dormant in lake sediment for like three years. So if there's a period of time where it's really unfavorable to spiny water flea growth, those resting eggs will be present and ready to hatch out whenever the right conditions arise. Okay, yeah, that's helpful. So it, yeah, it seems like maybe there's not that crash that you mentioned, Adam. Um, let's see, I see a question here. Um, what do zebra mussels do to reduce walleye populations? Um, how does that work? Sure, <clears throat> there's a lot of ways. Um, so zebra mussels are filter feeders. So they are constantly um, siphoning water through their body cavity and filtering out um, phytoplankton. Phytoplankton is the source of food for walleye prey for the, the things that walleye eat when they're young and growing. So there's reduced food availability, two levels below them in the food chain, but it does impact walleye growth. Um, so that's a nutshell of the food impacts. And then the what, zebra mussels change the physical environment of the lake for a walleye. Um, all the phytoplankton consumption increases the clarity of a lake. That might seem like a good thing, but lakes that are more clear um, get warmer. Walleye like cold, cooler, darker water. So walleye have less habitat available. And then that in, the changes in the light and temperature in the water column supports plant growth. Um, and so you will see more vigorous, um, both invasive and native plant growth, depending on what's in the lake. Um, and the plant growth changes the physical environment for walleye. And typically some of the, the sort of height and weight predators like pike or muskie tend to benefit from the increased plant cover. It does not help walleye. Those are the main ones. Okay, great. Um, let's see, somebody mentioned um, kind of with the zebra muscle question, I've heard low calcium content in a leak can prevent zebra mussel spread. Um, is this true and could it affect Boundary Waters lakes? Yeah, um, 
That, that is generally true. Um, calcium, calcium in the water is needed for their shell formation. So like Lake Vermilion is a good example. Um, zebra mussels, it is considered infested with zebra mussels, but they're relatively uncommon. They haven't really gotten a huge foothold in that lake. And it's believed it's because of the calcium levels as well as the, um, the other, the water chemistry of these Northern Shield lakes are, are not conducive. Um, but they can be present, um, they can spread. And the other thing that we're concerned about is just how quickly uh, lake conditions are changing with the climate. Um, uh, invasive species can interact with each other in weird and unpredictable ways. So, you know, erring on the precautionary side is, is definitely better. But yeah, it is true that um, the far, far northern Minnesota lakes tend to not have great zebra mussel habitat right now, but spiny water fleas are doing very well in these conditions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think that's a great point is, you know, just because of a certain habitat maybe isn't the best, you know, uh, ecosystem for something right now, it doesn't mean that we can trust that into the future that that'll be the case still. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah, and so yeah, that, that keeping them out is, is so important there. Um, I am seeing kind of a, a more general question from Travis here who says, I feel there's a general lack of knowledge even among experienced outdoors people that um, is there an emphasis on generalized education campaign or an education requirement with licensing perhaps, um, especially since angling is a major contributor. Yeah, um, I think that's a great question and suggestion. Um, it's, it's tricky. Um, I think that we have a very limited attention span and I, I feel like the, the regulatory agencies that are in charge of the permitting are sort of triaging the like immediate crises based on what happened last year and how much they feel that they can get away with. I know that there's an interest in talking about more AIS issues, but you're always walking that fine line between getting your average visitor to pay attention um, and not like feeding them just a fire hose of information about AIS. So I agree. I think, I think it's time to start incorporating some invasive species messaging. Like the Play Clean Go campaign that I mentioned is great. They're, they're keeping it really simple and easy to remember. So I think it's, I think it's similar to the Leave No Trace principles and the ideas about clean, drain, dry, but there, there isn't, I think there is an unmet need for um, techniques and training materials for outfitters and paddlers. Um, and I hope this discussion might spark some of that. The, the Stop Spiny campaign um, has a lot of excellent tools, but it is, the, the advantage of that is um, if you are cleaning your gear for spiny water fleas, you're pretty well covered for other AIS, even though it can seem a little bit narrowly focused on just that one species. But if you've cl cleaned up your residual water in your canoe and buckets, wiped down your gear, um, in theory, that would also take care of zebra mussels and any AIS plant species. So um, there's pros and cons to that approach. Um, but I, I think there's a lot that could be gained from it. Mm -hmm. um, kind of in that gear realm, Eric was asking um, how to get one of those, um, what cloths for wiping water that you yeah. recommended, especially for someone who's outside of Minnesota. Mm, okay. Um, so we've mostly been sending those around to lake associations and county managers. Um, <laughs> the We've supplied uh, the Lake Vermilion Association and Burnside Lake Association and the North St. Louis Soil and Water Conservation District with quite a few. So they're sort of out, they're out and circulating um, in the area, mostly at the resorts and boat launches. Um, the other way, yeah, that's the main way we have them. Unfortunately, at the university, we don't have the um, administrative fiscal um, permissions to buy our own supply and sell them. But I, I would say that this is, 
it's like any other Swedish just cloth that I think are becoming a lot more mainstream. Um, so obviously I think these are the best, but um, any Swedish just cloth would get the job done. Sure, great. Um, okay, diving back into the Q&A here. I see a regulatory question. Um, why doesn't the state of Minnesota classify jumping worms as illegal to sell? Is there a process for this or is that something that's in the works? There is a process and I believe, uh, to my knowledge, the state is um, pretty far along in that process and considering um, listing them as a prohibited species, which would, which would entail more regulation. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of complexities with that because they are already potentially widespread, at least throughout the metro. And it, there's there's gonna be a lot of logistic challenges with that, but it is being worked on. Mm -hmm. um, somebody wondering um, if it's legal to harvest and eat rusty crayfish. Um, I think you can get a permit for it in the rest of Minnesota, I don't know if there would be spe special regulations in the boundary waters. I would definitely check with a ranger. Um, I, I know that outside the boundary waters, there is a way to um, harvest rusty crayfish and people do harvest them and eat them. Mm -hmm. Good, yeah. Well, let us know how, how they are if anyone out <laughs> there um, tries them. Um, I see a question from Chris asking, do they spread diseases? And I think that was kind of in reference to the bait fish um, that you were mentioning. And if you could talk just a little bit more about some of those diseases and how that works. Um, yeah, well, it, it really kind of depends on the viral or the pathogen load, sort of like how we think about COVID and how the viral load that people might be spreading through their actions. I, I, I think a similar principle sort of applies, um, which, is, which is one way of thinking about why putting one minnow on your hook and, and putting it in the water and having it be eaten by a fish is, is generally low risk. It's not impossible, but that, that is not a high risk activity. It's when you take that bucket of a dozen or more leftover bait and you dump that and the water into a lake, that represents a much higher potential load of pathogens. Um, I think that's the best way I can explain it, not, not being a microbiologist or a veterinarian myself. Mm -hmm. And so the pathogens are then just kind of released into the water and, you know, fish that come along and eat those bait fish will be affected. Potentially, yep. Mm -hmm. And one of the issues is in the facilities where bait fish are um, housed or, or raised, um, they're, they're just in close quarters, it's recirculating water. Um, some of those practices um, in, an, in a facility that's not well managed or tested regularly um, can be spreading diseases. Or when fish are, if you harvest sick fish from the wild, um, which wild minnow harvesting is still very common, um, bring them, sell them, and spread them around. I mean, think about how a common cold spreads. You move around and you encounter more people. It's, it's a similar dynamic with a wild caught bait fish that might be sick. Sure. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, well, I will, I see one more question here, but I guess this is a last call for anyone to answer any, or enter any remaining questions that they do have um, into the chat or into the Q&A. Otherwise, I'll go ahead with this last one. Um, Bob is asking, have you seen any data on using leeches? Uh, I think that is as bait, and I'm not sure, Bob, if you meant um, how, how well they work or how, what they contribute to the ecosystem. Oh, that's a good question. Um, I, I don't know anything about leeches, but um, if you send me an email, Bob, uh, to the message there, I will pass that inquiry on to people who would know. Great, and I think that brings up a good point. Um, all of those resources that you mentioned earlier, I will send out in a follow-up email to everybody. So for folks that want some of the links or the resources that um, Meg had mentioned, um, look out for an email from me probably later on this week um, that has will direct you to all of those. Um, and, and you can send an email to the 
um, to the U and to Meg um, to get any remaining questions answered as well. Great. Well, I think um, that's it. Let's see. Oh, I see a question, a comment here about the rusty crayfish um, who says, I think all you need is a fishing license. Um, someone who says they're good to eat, um, but a little hard to pick out the meat. So um, thank you for that. <laughs> yeah, I'm a big fan of invasive invasivery. <laughs> yeah, trying to harvest and eat those things. Yeah, that's a great, a great idea. Um, well, thank you everybody for joining us this afternoon. Thank you, Meg. This was a really informative presentation and I'm sure we'll have kind of more information um, coming out and working with you um, in the future as we work to educate folks about invasive species, especially as they affect the boundary waters and other parts of Northern Minnesota. Um, yeah, I encourage anyone to follow up with questions. You can direct them to me or to Meg and we will try to get those answered and really, yeah, be thoughtful as you're out there and try to stop these spread of invasive species. So thanks again, everybody. Thanks, Meg. Thanks, um, everybody. Great presentation. Bye-bye. Right. Thanks, Maya.